Time now to talk politics with two of my favorite talk business and politics contributors, John Burris, Jessica Deloach Sabin. Welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. The conventions are over now, so we get to talk about them both in context, which we did earlier in the show here. So uh, let's start first, John Burris, with uh, strengths and weaknesses of both candidates now that we officially have Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Nothing surprising, lots of weaknesses, not very many strengths <laughs> other than their party <laughs> identification, which will be the reason they get most of the votes that they get. I mean, I think Donald Trump did exactly what people thought he would do. He's trying to be a little bit more um, maybe reserved or scripted, at least he was uh, at the convention when he spoke. But uh, overall, I, I agree with what you know several folks said, which is it seemed a little bit disorganized, disjointed. Uh, the speakers were just off and in some cases odd. And Are you referring to Chachi, Scott Bayo? <laughs> yeah, Chachi. I had to Google it. You gotta make America that. America I did, again. Yeah, <laughs> someone, so I didn't get the joke, I just, so I just looked him up. You know, uh, that's, that's, that's your generation, right? Oh, uh, but, man. But, you know, but uh, to my point, really, yeah. I, I didn't know who he was, but the point is it just is an odd list of people. Yeah. There were some good ones, and I don't want to minimize all of them. Tom Cotton from Arkansas, Leslie Rutledge did a great job. Uh, as to Governor Hutchinson. Nonetheless, it just seemed like an off group of people. And it, you know, overall, the message just wasn't that great either. I, as I watched the Democratic Convention to weave that in, it is funny how they were the ones talking about America being the shining city of the hill, uh, on a hill. Republicans were the ones really just talking about all the things we don't like. But that's really what this election cycle has turned into. Jessica, with the strengths or weaknesses of Donald Trump and uh, Hillary Clinton. What do, what, what's, what's their most powerful message for the fall? Wow, okay, well, Donald Trump's biggest weakness is recklessness, but his strength is masterful messaging that resonates with a substantial group of voters. And it's undeniable, and I think Democrats are wrong for not taking that seriously. As far as Hillary Clinton goes, you do have a lot of strength there, but as the Democratic National Convention has shown America, you have a really tight-knit party even though they do clearly have problems, it's a party that is interested in working together for what's best for this country. So there's a lot of strength there that you can take comfort in. It's really just a matter of you know, how she's going to go head to head with Donald Trump, knowing how reckless he is and knowing that his message appeals to a certain block of voters. So we saw um, after the Republican convention, there was probably a three to four point bounce uh, positive for Donald Trump. If you look at kind of an average of some of the polling there, It'll be a few more days before we get any Hillary Clinton numbers here. Let's just assume she gets a similar type bounce right there. Where does the race stand at this point in time? I still say that she's probably ahead of him, but anything can happen. I mean, this, this convention is going to be forgotten very soon. I mean, I, I hate to say it that way, but conventions come and go. They serve their purpose. Now the race is really on and anything can shift those poll numbers. You can have any kind of terrible disaster that happens here in this country that's due to some terroristic activity. You can have uh, even even the Zika virus can have an effect on this election cycle. So it's really there are a number of variables that you cannot anticipate and they will all have an impact on poll numbers. What do you think, John? Yeah, I agree with that. And, and as much as I was critical of the Republicans, I mean, the Democrats I think, I think the Republican convention seemed off because of who our messenger is, but in a lot of ways he's a variable that I would be afraid of if I was a Democrat. And more than anything, the Democrat message just seemed equally off. I mean, I, to Jessica's point, you know, the, the world is really, you know, at, an, at, a, at a dangerous place also. And you felt good if you were a Democrat at their convention because you had the president and all these people, you know, patting themselves on the back and everybody agreeing, you know, talking about how great things are, but things really aren't great. 70% of the country thinks we're heading in the wrong direction. There's a terrorist attack, usually by ISIS, virtually every day. And to have a bunch of opera singers or Broadway singers talking about what the world needs now is love, and you know, having a good time just really seems disconnected from reality. Your Twitter feed's blowing up right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it, I, it, it is not reality for most Americans. I'll and you some devil's advocate out there. You got low interest rates, low gas prices, low unemployment, record employment here in Arkansas and across the nation. Are those not good, positive trends? You have low unemployment because you have low participation. Arkansas's workforce has grown uh, f virtually faster than any state, and that's a separate topic worthy of discussion. But overall, nationally, we have low gas prices for a variety of reasons. You know, interest there's rates. There's a lot of gas. Yeah, there's a lot of gas <laughs> and, not, and not a lot of consumption. You have, and you know, we, labor participation is at its lowest rate that it has been, I think, in decades. So things are not well. People don't feel like they're better off, and the world is becoming a more and more dangerous place. 
Go ahead. But John, John has touched on something that I've observed throughout this entire election cycle, especially as it pertains to the GOP. You use the word feel. Well, Democrats are notorious for saying, but these are the facts. And what, what they're always accused of, and, and some of this criticism is correct, is that you do have to take into consideration how people feel. Mm -hmm. The problem with both parties is that they deal with absolutes that they expect people to just jump right on board with. And politics is all about knowing how your voters feel, even if the correct information flies in the face of what it is they say they feel. So how do you bridge the gap with that message? It can't all be about how you feel because there is reality and reality can be backed up by fact. Feeling is fleeting. Yeah. All right. We got to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back and talk about where some pivotal points in the campaign may come this fall. John Burris and Jessica Deloach Saban are my guests. We will be right back after this. Welcome back to Talk Business and Politics. I am with John Burris and Jessica Deloach Saban. We're talking about the presidential campaign. So convention's over. We talked about that in the last block. This block, let's talk about what happens going forward. What will be the most pivotal moment in the campaign this fall for you, John? Uh, I don't, Republicans need to keep the Senate. There's six or so really targeted United States Senate races. I think those are the most important and seeing how, tr how uh, Trump candidacy affects those. Overall, I think it's just going to be uh, watching a snail and a turtle who finishes the race first. I mean, or maybe just, you know, two drivers who can't drive and seeing who manages to hit the least amount of objects on their way. It's just going to be a um, kind of a depressing but entertaining election cycle. The debates will be important. World events will certainly dictate as they normally do. It will be interesting to see if, if, if Hillary Clinton takes the approach of just not really changing it up much as she seemed to not do during her speech and just kind of saying I'm here and I'm not him so vote for me I don't have to pander I mean to me that was her attitude and probably not a bad one but Trump's gonna get his stuff together too I would think and at the end of the day he's gonna say some things that other candidates won't say and that will either he did that this past week that will <laughs> either, with Russia so that will either speed his demise or be the variable that's needed to, to beat her and I think either one are equally possible pivotal points for you Jessica well, John touched on the Senate. When the Democrats have an actual chance of taking the Senate, I think that that's something that they should definitely be entertaining. That's, that's exciting, it's promising, right? But also, I think figuring out what message emerged, what is it, what's the message that Democrats are going to want to carry past Election Day? If Hillary Clinton becomes the next President of the United States, what's her agenda? Let's start talking about that now and let, let's let it be something that Americans can really sink their teeth into uh, because we've seen through the Obama presidency, you take on hard issues and you're going to have some hard consequences that your party will struggle with over time. But what we've seen is a stronger America emerge from those challenges, but we still have a long way to go and Democrats need to be reasonable about that and also understand the purpose in not over promising and and under delivering. I got you. So here's my uh, theory, and I'm going to let you guys shoot holes in this. I think that the race, the trajectory, the uh, who's going to be win who's going to be leading, and how it finishes, is pretty much set after the first head-to-head -head debate. Everybody's going to tune in for it. They want to see how they fare against each other. And once that's happened, I think if you're undecided, you're going to be pretty decided by then. And the yeah. partisans are already decided. So. I don't know if the second and the third debates really change things that much. Do you, would you, either one of you entertain that as a theory? Well, I mean, if, if the first debate is the train wreck that it could be with people, with two people who are talking over each other or just being mean to each other, because that's entirely possible. I would like to think that Secretary Clinton would not, would not do that. Donald Trump is entertaining enough on his own, and if one person needs to be the adult and have the conversation that America needs to be having, it's going to be her. But, you know, these debates are entertaining. Who knows? Anything can happen, especially if, going back to what we said earlier, some major event occurs in yeah. this country. It changes things. Yeah. John? I, I don't know. I, I think all three debates, there are enough variables to, um, to really make either, any of them significant. Donald Trump is just crazy. And, I mean, Hillary Clinton can prepare all she wants. She could sit in a studio all she wants and have the best handlers in the world uh, prepare her. But... I mean, just to say it like it is, the moment that Bill Clinton or that Donald Trump stands on the stage and looks at her and says, "Here's what I think about your husband, and he's a sexual offender," um, that that's never happened to her before, and how she handles it will matter a lot. And are you coaching I, Trump on this? Are you debate coach? I think he's going to do it, yeah. and I think that there's a lot of things that he can say that people don't normally say. 
as I said, they'll either speed his demise or they'll there'll be enough of a wild card to, to shake it up to the point to where it could be the reason he wins. I, I think every debate there's an opportunity for things like that to happen, for him to be the non-traditional politician, and I would be very nervous if I was Hillary Clinton. His theory is to, to blow up the Electoral College map and, and take some Rust Belt states right now. I've kind of got about 13 that I'm keeping an eye on as potential mm -hmm. swing states, but I think four of them are really the big ones to watch, Ohio, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Florida. Mm -hmm. I think that if you win three or four of those four states, I, I don't see how you don't win 270. Well, those are the states that he needs to be talking to. He can engage in dog whistle politics all the live long day, but if she's having the conversation that Americans want to be having and they need someone who's speaking to them, that will resonate with voters because people can only take so much controversy. He's the Kardashian candidate. <laughs> he is empty <laughs> rhetoric. There is no promise with him. We don't know anything about where he stands on issues. He has no plans, but he really, really wants to be elected president, so much so that he'll call on the help of Russia. Four years ago, can you imagine if President Obama would have called on the help of Russia? Hey, why don't you use your KGB tactics over here to undermine my democracy to help me out? Four, that doesn't go over very well. Four years ago, Mitt Romney said Russia was our biggest geopolitical threat, he and did. Barack Obama, in his typical fashion, condescendingly mocked him and, and basically called him stupid. He actually wanted to talk about China because no. at the time that was the conversation that the president thought we should be having. Things change, policy changes, relationships with foreign nations change. I agree with you that Hillary Clinton has to, if she speaks to what voters want, I think she'll win. The problem is what they want right now is not songs about what we need is love and to hear four more years of Barack <laughs> Obama. Right. We got to wrap mm. it up. We will take this conversation to the coffee shop across yeah. the street. How about that? John Burris, Jessica Deloach, Saban, thank you so much. Thank you. That's all for this week's edition of Talk Business and Politics. I'm Roby Brock. We'll see you next time.